For many years before World War II, the biggest event at the University of Chicago's old Stagg Field was the annual football face-off between the Michigan Wolverines and the Chicago Maroons. Tens of thousands of fans packed the stands for those games, but little could any of those fans have known that under the grandstand, a far more significant event would enshrine the stadium in history. It happened on December 2nd, 1942, a few years after the university ended its football program and Stagg Field was becoming an aging relic. A 41-year-old Nobel laureate physicist decided it was a good place to conduct what would turn out to be an earth-shattering experiment. It was the first time there was a project of this scale in science that involved a, a range of scientists all working here on one large project. The mastermind behind that large project was Italian immigrant Enrico Fermi, who had become a luminary in physics long before he reached Chicago. In his native Italy, he was dubbed the Pope of Physics by his colleagues and students. And in 1938, he received the Nobel Prize for his research into nuclear reactions. By that time, though, German scientists had discovered that fission, or splitting the atom, was possible. And when word reached the anti-Nazi world, the race was on to achieve the next monumental step, a race that intensified when the U.S. entered World War II. They knew if they could multiply that energy that it could be tremendously powerful. They understood it could be weaponized. They understood that even before they did it. Fermi and his family escaped fascist Italy, landing in New York City, where he became a professor at Columbia University. But at the behest of Albert Einstein, President Roosevelt ordered the best minds in physics to come together to work on a nuclear weapon in advance of one the Germans might have been producing. And he believed the best place to assemble that team under one roof was at the University of Chicago. With Fermi at the helm, the experiment conducted under the Stagg Field grandstand was inelegantly called Chicago Pile 1. They basically built a, a pile, and the pile was made up of a wooden braces, uh, a large number of black uh, graphite bricks, and uranium, basically, uranium pellets. As shown in this film in which Fermi recreated his historic experiment, rods made of cadmium that could be pulled in and out of the pile were used to absorb uranium atoms and ensure a possible chain reaction didn't get out of control. After a month of intensive labor, Fermi and his students began the test on the morning of December 2nd. But a few hours later, on the brink of history, Fermi told everyone to take a lunch break. The experiment resumed in the afternoon, and physicist George Weil removed the control rod that launched the nuclear age. By this time, Fermi was in full control, and he knew precisely how far to pull the last rod out. He gave me my instructions, and he announced to the uh, attending, uh, those attending that we would now have a chain reaction, and sure enough, we did. Among those present at the landmark achievement was Nobel Prize winning physicist Arthur Compton, who raced to break the news to James Conant, the chairman of the National Defense Research Committee in Washington. In a spontaneously coded exchange, Compton reported, the Italian navigator has landed in the New World, to which Conant asked, how were the natives? Compton's reply, very friendly. Here at the University of Chicago, an exhibit has been created to commemorate that historic experiment of December 1942. This is a replica of the size of Chicago Pile 1, inside of which that first sustained nuclear chain reaction occurred. A little over two and a half years after the success of Chicago Pile 1, Fermi was among the scientists present at Los Alamos, New Mexico, to witness the outcome of what he achieved. It was the first test of a nuclear bomb, informally called the gadget. Even the best minds in the world didn't know if it would work or what would happen. But at 5.30 a.m. on July 16, 1945, they found out. Only three weeks later, a similar bomb was the first to be used as a weapon. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima. Late in 1945, atomic scientists alarmed by the potential of the new age published their first bulletin, ironically, at the University of Chicago. The bulletin is still published today, albeit digitally, and tracks, among other things, how close humanity is to nuclear annihilation. Technology continues to move at an extraordinarily rapid clip. We know that it's going to bring enormous benefits. We know that nuclear medicine 
has helped hundreds of thousands, millions of people, but there's also the risks, and that's what we focus on. Because if we can manage those risks, we're going to be able to reap the benefits. After the war, Enrico Fermi remained at the University of Chicago in its Institute of Nuclear Studies. Many scientists there actively opposed the testing and construction of nuclear weapons, but Fermi never publicly revealed his thoughts. He died of stomach cancer on November 28, 1954, at the age of 53. And he's buried at Oakwood Cemetery, about 10 blocks due south of where he reached the New World. An enigmatic sculpture by English artist Henry Moore marks the spot where Fermi and his team made history. Moore admitted that it's a combination skull and mushroom cloud, which he said symbolized the hopes and fears launched on that auspicious December day. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Eddie Arusa.